Hi, this is Steve from Samori. Um, I have John Day here with me as well. Hi, Ron. He's hiding over here. <laughs> We're going to go through with you with Recon Lab today and, and show you what the tool is all about. If you're not familiar with it, if you are familiar with it, hopefully you'll learn something new, but it's it's a kind of a unique tool um, in, in the sense that we didn't do what everybody else did. We kind of went off in left field and left field being the correct field. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is, um, it's 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 kind of interesting. It's like why do we uh, you know why do we actually create another tool? And and it's a pretty simple question to answer. It's because there's tools out there, in, in my opinion, that were missing some really important uh, key components to to computer forensics. Um, so I, I learned a long time ago when I was actually teaching, um, and I, I always ask a question in the beginning of class, and it's it's the same question I always ask, which is, what is the definition of, of computer forensics? And, and you would think that everybody could actually answer that question that I teach, because usually it's you know computer forensic examiners of all you know various experience. And the thing that shocked me the most, and I'm not shocked anymore, but no one can really give me a good answer on what the the true definition of computer forensics is. So that led me to thinking, you know, that people are just going to work and just working, and we're all going through the motions of of working and doing our job, right? Um, but the problem is. We're not really thinking about what we're doing. And so when you just go to work and you just don't think, and I know you got to think to get to work and stuff like that, but and to do cases, but when you really don't think about what you're doing, um, and we had this experience here lately with, with our team here at Samori. I, I went in at our morning huddle today and I said, listen, treat every task like it's your first time. And so because you know, mistakes are made or you know, simple things can be corrected. And it's usually because we're not paying attention to details. And, and so just something simple that your grandma or grandpa probably told you, like all those things that you never want to repeat and because you turned into your parents, like that's what I'm starting to repeat to people now. So the one of the things is, you know, you know, treat every task like it's your first time. When we started doing that, we realized, you know, with forensic tools that, you know, we, we just went decades without even thinking about what we're doing. And this is like the in, in everybody. So that that's actually, um, in the forensic field. So we, we had the opportunity or we wanted to actually grow from an imaging tool from Paladin before that, right, into, you know, what my niche was, which is Mac forensics. So just a little bit of background about me. Um, I came from U.S. law enforcement, spent 15 years there, um, taught for the U.S. Department of State for some time, um, worked in the civilian side for some time, had multiple different jobs. So I've been law enforcement, I've been a customer, I've been a developer. And so, you know, our hardware, Tolino, the software, all that's designed and conceptualized by myself. Um, and so what I try to do when I conceptualize something is just take it down to the the bare beginnings, the, the bare, you know, just start from scratch. And so this is kind of where things went kind of wonky in the forensics world. So really quick, and then I'll show you the tool and I'll get into it and I'll, and I'll tell you what we did. So we've all become lemmings. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, again, the part about we just come to work, we don't think, we just do. And, you know, and of course, I appreciate what everybody does and stuff like that, but nobody stops to ask the question, should should we be doing this way or should we still be doing it this way? Right. So that's one problem that we have. So, for example, like um, if you're familiar with EO1s, right, so everybody's like using EO1s, EO1s, EO1s. We've heard it a couple of times today from customers. I need to convert this to an EO1. And then we ask them why they don't know the answer. Well, I'm just being asked for it. Well, why are they asking for this? They don't know. They don't know why you're using it. So if you ask the original creator, should you be using EO1, he will tell you absolutely not. So the way he defines it is it's a Frankenstein monster that he can't call back. That's the developer's own words. So as you know, there has been enhancements to that, and that's probably what you should be using if you're going to stick with expert witness format. But as you know, people are still asking for EO1s, right? So then, you know, the next thing is that I'm going to call it greed. And so, and what I mean by that is, you know, there. if you look at the market share of computers out there, the majority is going to be Windows. And that, that's just, just a given, right? I, I can't argue with that. So if you want to make money, where do you code your tools? You, you code them for Windows, right? Because it's where the market share is, is where you're going to make the most money. So when money's dictating what you do, um, that can actually cause problems. And then that leads you into the next part of it, you know, what's been going wrong over the years is the coding. So if you've been, you know, teaching Windows forensics or developing Windows forensics tools, or, you know, you're sticking with Windows, let's just say, and there's nothing wrong with Windows. Windows, every, every tool has its purpose and, you know, it's good and it's bad. 
So, you know, not bashing Windows, please don't take that because sometimes when Mac frustrates me a lot nowadays. So, um, but anyway, basically these these tools have been over decades been coded to to actually deal with Windows artifacts. Then lo and behold, you know, Mac got popular again. And, and then people are like, well, can you support it? And there's been various support over the year. And I'm just going to say limited support. So that's been sort of the problem. So then when we decided to actually go into a uh, forensic analytical suite, like, you know, our, our flagship, if you want to call it, you know, I I'm, am lucky in the sense that I, I'm not, you know, um, worried about the money. I'm not worried about the money. Not to say I have a ton of money. It's just, you know, I learned a long time ago that money is not really what's important. It's what you do. So if you if you take the bias out of why you're developing a forensic tool and you just develop it from the ground up, kind of like what we did with the Tolino workstation, like how do you just do this the right way, put everything else aside, profit and everything, just do it from the ground up the right way, the best that you can. Then you go to yourself, you ask some simple questions, which is right, you know, like, well, what is the hardest, you know, file system and, and operating system to analyze? And I think most people would argue that would be a Mac file systems and Mac artifacts, right? It, it's very proprietary when it comes to that. So, you know, what's out there that actually can fully support Mac? Well, that's a simple answer. It's Mac. So then if you go down to, you know, can, can Mac support the Windows file system and artifacts? Yes you know, and, and natively, right? Can it support mobile device file systems and artifacts? Yes. Can it uh, support Unix or Linux artifacts? It's based on Unix. The answer is yes, right? Um, can it, can Windows support Mac file systems and artifacts natively? The answer is no. So if you look at it from a logical perspective, it only makes sense to actually develop a forensics tool on Mac if you could only pick one, right? So, and hopefully you guys can pick as many as you can afford, right? Or you can get in your hands. So the thing is, is from the perspective of us, we just made logically only, the only sense was to actually start with a Mac and, and not because this is something I used since 1989. So we started with the Mac and then we started building our tools upon that. Now, aside from you know, just using logic to actually support the most amount of um, artifacts and file systems as native as possible. Um, we, we started looking at some other things that we ran into. So th things that just weren't even addressed into the, the forensic community or analysis for, for forever, for as long as I've been around doing it, and that's been since 97. So here's the thing. We always have a problem, you know, we, we can be the greatest examiner in the world and we can show you what happened. But the one thing we can't talk about much is, you know, um, you know, who did that? What caused it? Was it malware, Trojan, virus? Was the person hacked? That's what they're going to claim, right? Especially when you're dealing with CSAM cases and stuff, right? They're going to be like, yeah, I know you found that stuff on my computer, but, you know, I didn't know it was there. What if I can tell you that you can tell them that they knew it was there? What if I can show you how? What if I can prove it with the tools? Well, that's something we can do. So that's something that we built into Recon Lab, right? The other thing that we did was we made it easier to, to actually compare and see the entire picture of a person's, you know, daily habits and, and life. So, you know, like I'm, I'm looking around here right now and if you can kind of see, so I'm at my desk on my laptop. Um, I have a Google Pixel that's over here. I have an iPad that's sitting over here. Behind me, I have a Windows laptop, whatever brand that is, Acer. So I have all these different devices that I've been using throughout the day. Well, to get the complete picture of the entire day, you know, I've been on the iPad a little bit, on my phone a lot, on this computer a lot, my Mac, and also on the Windows computer, actually in a virtual machine. So there's all these different things that I was in. So if you wanted to see the whole picture, you'd have to have a tool that actually can integrate all that into one view, one timeline, which is kind of what I want to get into next. So we, we can we built that into Recon Lab. So speaking of that is the ability to look at timelines. So the, another thing that I've seen, and I talk about this a lot as well, is the psychology behind forensic reporting. So if, I guess to go back to the first question I, I brought up, you know, what is the definition of computer forensics, right? So once you understand that, you'll understand where I'm going here. So the definition of computer forensics is essentially being able to prepare evidence to be used, and here's the important part, in a court of law. So preparing evidence to be used in the court of law for computer forensics or digital forensics, preparing digital evidence to be used in the court of law. So again, how do you best do that with a tool? Well, the tools that I've used and seen over the years are kind of what I call just like uh, ran randomizers, like they're just spray and pray, right? You you bookmark a bunch of different things that are just, oh, that's 
not good. That's not good. That's not good. And then all of a sudden, you, the re, you know tool just produces a report, and the report is out of sequence. Well, that's the problem right there. If a tool produces your you know data that you're trying to present on to a court of law, to humans, I would guess that's you know judge, magistrate, jury, depending on what you know jurisdiction you're in. How they're humans, right? How do humans think? They don't think random, right? When's the last time that you actually picked up a book from the store and then opened to the middle of the book and read the 15th chapter and started there and then went back to the eighth chapter and then went to the 27th chapter and then went back to chapter two? And but you read the whole book, right? Does that make any sense? Are you going to understand the information that's in the book? The answer is no. It's not going to make any sense to you because it's out of order. Well, why should you produce forensic reports like that? So that was something that really bothered me by some of the, the, the reporting systems that I've seen in other tools. So I fixed it in R. So I, I've designed it in a way that you can take all the bookmarks that you have, all the important information and order it in a way that's logical. And then finally, what I have here is, uh, well, not finally, but there's only so much I can talk about and show you hopefully here in a second, is uh, something that just blows my mind. And it's just little small things that you go, it's not really genius, but no one's ever done it. And that's time zones. So use an example like me who, when pre-pandemic, right, I, I was traveling quite frequently and I would like leave Philadelphia, fly to uh, Frankfurt, from Frankfurt, maybe fly to Dubai, from Dubai fly into, you know, Singapore, from Singapore, fly back to LA and then, you know, to Chicago and then back to Philly again. And I do like a worldwide trip. How many time zones did I just go through? Well, usually I take my laptop with me, right, my MacBook, and I've probably been through, I don't know, I can't even count that high, but probably six or seven time zones in a matter of two weeks or so. Well, when we load our evidence into a case, we usually pick a time zone, right? Or if you're, you know, to avoid some of this, they do GMT. Well, what if I just told you that I can say that between this time and this time, I was in this time zone, and between this time and this time, I was in this time zone. It just makes sense. So we built that into the tool. So what I'm gonna do now is actually hopefully show you the tool. So Recon Lab and show you some of these features that are that are that we built into it to kind of um, actually help make life a little bit easier, I hope. So again, I hope you understand why we did this on the Mac um, and it's you know, to make it a little bit easier so we can see as most, because again, we support more than just Macs here, but we started with the hardest first. Now there's more into the Mac than just um, how do I say this? The you know the standard timestamp. So let me start with that right there, because this is another one that's missed quite often. People don't seem to understand. So you know we can navigate through this just like anything else, right? It's just a normal file system view. All right, but here's the thing that I want to show you here: date modified, um, date access, right? Uh, date change, date. I'm sorry, date modified, date change, date access. You guys are in last use date, so you guys are familiar with some of these timestamps. But the ones that most forensics tools miss are these right here, right? Last used date, date added, content creation date, content modification date. These are what I call finder timestamps. And we can see them down here in our detailed pane. So we have them broken down for POSIX or Unix timestamps here. And then you, because Mac's based on Unix, and then you have your extended attribute timestamps. What most people don't understand is that these are the timestamps that the Mac utilizes, not these. So when you look at other forensics tools or you load Mac data on other forensics tools, you're being exposed to these timestamps. You're not being exposed to these. These come from something that's called extended attributes, right? So it's Apple metadata. So you can see right here when I switch over to this view here, there's some timestamps and some other information that's being pulled out, such as like use dates and use counts, right? So those right there are actually different timestamps that are held in a different location. It's not kept with the physical file itself. It's not easily extracted and anything that's not Mac related or even some Mac tools that were built on other platforms have to reverse engineer this and use um, scripts that are built by professors and universities when they get around to it to actually pull this data instead of just using native libraries. So for me, whether you're doing Windows or you're doing Linux or you're doing a Mac, you know, it's it's better to just go native when you can, you know, to the best of your, your ability. Right, to just stay native because a Mac can interpret Mac, Windows can interpret Windows, Linux can interpret Linux. So that's kind of where we went with that. So anyway, what we see right here, this is just kind of like our basic file system view. We have a lot of stuff that's in here, like three stage processing. So to make your life easier, what we've done is we've started out by doing automated analysis. So automated analysis is the ability to actually parse um, 
automatically parse artifacts for you. And again, we don't have everything parsed in the world. It's impossible, but we do the best we can. We, you know, we support thousands of artifacts, like just thousands of artifacts between. Let me see if I can find those here. We're going to go to where's the artifact list now? We moved our thing around. The oh, yep, process, process yep, yep. process, run, uh, artifacts. run artifacts. Thank you. Yeah, this is the new view. All right, so. When you're actually beginning a case, you can actually load evidence in there and you can set this up ahead of time. I already ran a case to save you a little bit of time. So we have Mac OS plugins, iOS plugins, WinOS plugins, Android, uh, Google Takeout. So all this stuff in here, for example, um, you can break it down and there are subcategories within there. You could be very granular in what you want to search. And over here, you can actually see the different things that are supported for, for example, like you know, wireless networks are supported across each device. So we do that for you and then you can run it at any time and I'll give you a little trick here, but you can see it's broken down here once it runs. So we can actually pull out the artifacts within here and then we can see if we go into like Brave Browser, for example, we can pull the different stuff out. There's multiple tabs for different things. We can break this down. We can do different searching. We can produce reports from within each of the plugins by themselves. So if you're only doing, for example, a history on this, you can produce multiple types of reports from here. You can bookmark. There's lots of you know things that we can do. All right, so that's going to be the first stage processing. Second stage is what we have down here, which is we call our buckets. So we have your, you know, when you think about it over, you know, nowadays with, with file systems, they're, they're pretty, and, and operating systems, they're pretty standardized, right? You have your um, basically SQLite databases, right? You have your XML or plist in the case of Max. Um, you have a registry, you, you have basically hex, you know, that you can look at stuff. And so we, we build in basically um, advanced viewers for each of these types of artifacts. So if we don't automatically process something for you, you can send it to the bucket or you can process it within our, our you know, property list viewer or XML viewer or hex viewer or SQLite viewer where you can actually run, you know, SQLite queries from within the tool itself. If you have some skills, you know, some basic SQLite um, um, syntax, you can actually query, um, run queries and, you know, shape the data in any way you want. So you have full control here to do that, which is kind of cool. And then finally, you have your manual analysis, right? You can just manually step through the file system. But hopefully, for what we build into the tool can actually make things a lot easier. So let me go back to some of the problems that we solved, right? So let me go back up in here and go back to the source, for example, and I think we're in the uh, documents folder, right? So human interaction. And so forgive me, this is a new interface that we just released um, not too long ago. So I have to find it myself. So what I'm opening up here is the configuration tab and under here is preferences. And you see this little button here, it says highlight user open files. So we can toggle that, hit apply. And what it's gonna do is something that I think it's, it's very simple, but it makes a huge difference. And so most of my investigations that I actually did when I was law enforcement and still help other law enforcement agency with today is you know the sexual exploitation against children right so the thing is they always say you know oh yeah you caught me with the stuff on my system but i swear i didn't do it i didn't actually download this stuff i didn't interact with it so now look what we have here so when i turn that on and go back into this tab what we see right here is a lot of files that are highlighted these files that are highlighted right here is basically proof that a human being on a Mac actually went through and, and touched this particular um, document. So file, whatever it may be. So picture, video, whatever it may be. This is proof that that an actual um, human being touched it. And you might ask yourself, well, well, how did that happen? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. So there's extended attributes that are built into the Mac because of this little guy up here, Spotlight, right? That tracks when a user opens the file, when a human being, so this is not you know, somebody remoting into your system. This is not like, you know, malware being hacked. It's not a virus opening it. It has to be someone, the way Apple describes it, goes to a file and goes click, click, and opens that file. Then it's actually tracked. So we can actually just highlight files for you. So imagine this again, if you're doing a CSAM case, um, and then you're like, you know, hundreds of thousands of pictures in there, and you see, you know, the the ones that are illicit images or whatever, and they're yellow, It's it's pretty easy to, to prove right then and there that that's it. I just need to bookmark, you know, these particular cases, right? Or tag them however I want, um, that these are actually the files that are, you know, 
that are going to be of interest to me, right? So we can do all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about in here. One of the other things I want to talk about really quick, just to make life easier, is this, right? So we've all started a case and, you know, left for the weekend or for the night and just hope it's finished by the time, you know, processing when you come back in the morning. I fixed that too. So, you know, the Mac is actually very powerful in what it does. So it's a really good machine to work on and have a forensics tool. The other thing that's really nice, for example, if if you know that, you know, like say user accounts are segregated, right? So like I know that, you know, one user can't jump into another user's account typically, right, on, on, um, on a Mac or another file system that's, you know, segregated. Then what we can do is we can just run those modules that we want to run just on that local directory that user right so you see right here we have file system modules that consist of you know apple metadata or exit metadata or signature analysis your hashes and then we just added a bunch of ai features um, to the tool for this year um, such as face analysis you know, optical character recognitions weapons identifications um, fire so like you know if you see explosions or think arsons or things like that or unfortunately terrorism type stuff and then skin tone detection which Actually, I was pretty impressed today by this with our tool, not to pat ourselves in the back or anything, but you know, there's a lot of this stuff that exists in other tools, but when we implement it, I'm like, you know, how good is it? Because there's a lot of tweaks that you can do as far as the percentages of skin tone. It, it actually, the AI in this is is pretty cool. So let me, let me show you that really quick here. So I ran a lot of the stuff already just to go ahead and do it, but for example, skin tone detection. Well, let me tell you what I did because I'm, you know, it's a different world and stuff like that, right? Didn't want to offend anybody. So I'm like, well, how can I show skin tone stuff without offending it? So I just downloaded a bunch of CSAM. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> John's like, what? No. So I, I was trying to find like pictures that were um, not offensive. So I was like uh, Olympic swimmers and, uh, uh, you know, track and field. I'm just like Olympic stuff because that was on my mind right now. So I tried to do that and, and guess what happened? I got one picture one picture i'm like I, how can i download and i'll even show it to you um i'll get the source here so source and then we'll go down to the ai features and i'll go into the features here and i want to skin so i'll even show you the pictures here so here's what i did i started out with the the basically the olympic type stuff and track and field and surfers and i'm like yeah they got they all got skin and stuff right the only picture that showed up was that one right here this was the only the only picture that got caught by the skin detection and i don't know why but then I'm like, this isn't working. So I went out and got swimsuits and bikinis. So I apologize if anybody's offended, but I had to show how the tools work. And at least that's what I told my wife. I'm like, this is all for the <laughs> sake of work, honey. I swear to God. So um, anyway, so when we go down to now, when I loaded the swimsuit pictures in there, guess what happened? It all popped up. So anything. So and I, I think I know what's going on here. I have to confirm with our developers. But the way that the AI works for the tool here for the skin detection, it, it's I hate to say it, it's looking for genitalia and it looks knows the difference between just a person swimming or surfing or anything like that versus like like say full frontal or something like that where um, genitalia can be seen because we can actually you'll see here if I can demonstrate this. So let me bookmark a couple of these pictures. Um, and just to actually bookmark those because when I produce a report, you'll understand what I'm saying. Because we want to, we also build into the tool the ability to block out the genitalia if you want to, instead of blurring the picture, which we had that in our report as well. So if you produce a report, you can blur it and you know, so you can pry out it. This actually blocks out the genitalia. So, you know, um, the um, chest area, the, the, the lower regions and stuff like that. I did actually see feet one time too. So I guess that's if somebody has a foot fetish or what. So, but you'll see that in an example. So we actually built the AI. So I might as well just talk about the rest of that in here for weapons, you know, like we can detect like guns, like just specifically. And of course, you know, I had to go ahead and look at James Bond and of course Miami Vice, right? So that kind of stuff and shaft, where's shaft? I got shaft in here too. Yeah, gotta get shaft. So, and then down here for rifles, so we can differentiate between guns and rifles. So we can see that in here, even this one, which is a lot of camo, it's able to depict that out with the AI that's built into it. Uh, same thing with fire analysis. So we can actually do that as well. Uh, fire, so, and then what else do we have? Face searching, that's pretty cool. So, but let me go to OCR. So OCR is something we built into the tool as well. And you can see like these actual, um, these are actually, pictures that were identified from the samples that I ran it against 
um, where it picked out some of the things and it, it will show you down here. It'll be recorded in the detailed information here and that can actually be searched later on. And it obviously this is handwritten, so it's some is going to be better than others. But I picked out some funny um, stuff last night and then it actually different signs or sayings and picked out. These are some screenshots from some of my other um, websites and companies and things. So but you can see right here it actually um, pulls it out and you can see it. So for different documents, emails. So you know how that goes, right? You have somebody that has a, a picture inside of an email and has text on it. That can actually be OCR and you can actually search by it. So up here, we've moved all of our buttons around up to the top menu and you can see that there's actual different. If we do file search, there's a place to do OCR search. So we can just type it in there and it'll search through the OCR text. Um, since I have file search put up here, I know I got so much to talk about. You can see that we can go by your Unix timestamps and also the extended attribute timestamps or any combination thereof, file size, file name, you know, all sources or just some sources. We can break it down by that. And then that's just for file search. Um, we do content search, of course, and you can build your different categories and stuff in there. You, you can search by Exit metadata, Apple metadata. And this is a good one here, and I'm going to see if it works. I'm going to go live, right? So recognize face. So we, we have extracting faces. So let me go back to the face thing here. Um, so face analysis, right? You can run this against um, your. That's that's cute face for Poppy. So all right, <laughs> I'm distracted now. Puppies. Yeah, so you can go through it here and it's going to take anything. It's a face and as you see, it's even getting your little pets too, just in case there's crimes against animals, which PETA should be happy for us now. We support them. I wonder if that actually works. What's that? It's, it's face recognition for the dog. What if a dog like Paris Hilton's dog is kidnapped again or something? I bet you that would work. So anyway, yeah, so anyway, you can see here all kinds of faces, including animals, right? They actually get pulled out through here that you can do. When you click on one, there's a lot of baseball players and stuff in here. You pick one and stuff, it'll actually pull these guys out of the difference um, throughout the whole thing. So if you have, but the nice thing about what we've done is you can search by faces, right? So if I go back up to search here, recognize face, and, and forgive me for being a geek here, um, we're gonna select a picture to search by, and I wanna go to my desktop, and I'm gonna take good old Captain Kirk. So I've got some pictures of Captain Kirk in here, going to open that up and what you're going to do once you load what you want there could be right multiple people in a picture so you're going to say extract faces so it's going to go through do its you know facial recognition ai stuff right where they sky net and all that good thing comes in there and identifies the face and i'm just going to type in a name for the search which is kirk i'm going to click start it's going to do its old good old ai thing and it's going to run it against the database of faces that we just did and eventually it's going to go ding and well it doesn't go ding but it's going to go ding in my head and then it's going to give us a result so we're going to let that sit there and run um and then what will happen in here in a second is down here you're going to see a face search so i've already done this for picard now you see kirk shows up it says it's got three hits and i double click on that and out of all the stuff there we now see again that we got Captain Kirk even with his perm days from back in the good, the good old days. God, yeah, so pretty cool, right? So it's if you got an image that you're trying to see if it exists amongst many faces that are actually in it, uh, think I'm thinking organized crime, you know, intelligent type stuff. It's pretty cool, so we can pull these out. So I did it for Picard as well for the search. Oh, by the way, anybody can ask me questions at any time if anybody's we're, got anything. We're good for now. Or if you guys are all stunned and in awe and you just don't know what to say. All right, so what are the cool things that we do in here? I'm trying to think of some of the things I talked to you about. Um, yeah, so let's do this one. Again, let's like say you, you actually image something and in that image you have a virtual machine or you have iOS backups or you have, um, you know, disk images or you have, um, you know, um, basically VHDs and stuff like that, right? So stuff where people can have other file systems in there. Um, we can easily add those as a source. So what we do for you is automatically identify anything that would be considered a disk image or a VHD or, you know, a virtual machine image. And you can essentially just right click and add it as a source. And what's really cool about this is if it, if it detects like it's Windows or if it's Mac or anything like that, it'll go through and run those automated features for you and, and do that processing for 
for you and include all those things into the the rest of the tool which i'll show you here in a second so again you can get that complete picture of everything that's there so again if we identify there's mobile backups in here we can just go ahead and pull this out right click add it as a source and it'll process those ios backups and go ahead and run our automated analysis on that add that to the rest of the stuff that i'm going to show you here as well get that complete picture so that's kind of cool what we do right there um ram analysis you know we can load ram images we have ram tools built into this thing um again we can break things down by apple metadata which you can set at the time at the beginning for example like um where froms is always a great extended attribute so we can actually find out where a particular file came from i remember one of my first cases where i you know actually utilize this thing when I was doing exams for the state police. Um, you know, when you do this for quite a long time, you, you kind of get angry and you're just like, where the heck did these people have time to find all these things? Where do they get it from? Well, I found out that Apple gives you the answers. Like that's where they come from. There's an extended attribute that says where from, and then we can go through and we can see like this was done through a, a, an iCloud message, you know, transfer. So probably through messages or iMessages, depending on what version it is, right? You can just see exactly that this was like downloaded from the web. You know, you can see that it was came from a mail message. Apple just tells you exactly where these things come from. So you can see right there that came from the Sig Sawyer website. So all kinds of stuff right here. So this came from the SpaceX Experimental Vehicle Division. Well. That would be good to know because this one right here is actually a case on you know uh, intellectual property theft so i might want to tag this as a new tag and just say ip theft right and then select a color i like fuchsia it's my favorite so i put that in there and we now have that bookmarked right so again pretty simple um, if we go down through some of the more things that we haven't assigned, exit metadata, again, who the author, is there anything with GPS coordinates? With GPS coordinates, we can actually bring up a map of the world where it actually came from. We, if you're connected online, you're allowed to be connected online, you can actually go online to do it that way, see the actual real thing. Um, with online maps, get more detailed because there's only so many levels of maps that we can put in here for you. MIME types, this is great. So. Um, this is one of the things that's great about the Mac itself is that it's based on Unix and in Unix heavily from the beginning of mail, you know, like Unix mail, that's where email came from, right? Is uh, email or Unix email introduced MIME types and think file signature analysis, right? So every file signature in the world is already built into the Linux, you know, operating system, or sorry, Unix operating system. Mac is based on Unix, so it's built in there as well. So every single signature that you can possibly think of or want to think of is actually in here, which is really nice. So we can just go ahead and select, you know, really quickly anything we want um, to search by. You know, image formats, you know, we can actually really quickly go through and identify different, you know, image formats and, you know, go switch to the gallery view and see that stuff as well. So pretty, pretty quick through the uh, file signature stuff. Um, facial, we already did that. Uh, let's see, this is the AI stuff. File extensions, you can set your own file extensions. Like if you want to go ahead and set up, I know I'm always looking for uh, QuickBook files. And, you know, if you're doing financial crimes, you can go ahead and do that kind of here as well and set that up. Um, so file size, we break this out like, hey, it's pretty interesting to see what's over one gig. It may be a virtual machine, which I can then add as a source to the case. So which would be good to do and process that, you know, so we can break this down as well for you. Uh, snapshots is really cool, which I didn't process those as well. But um, Apple includes something called um, time machine snapshots. And what is cool about this, and I don't know if I have anything. Let me bring up my terminal. Um, list local, no, TM util, right? TM util. TM util list local snap, snapshots thing. All right, no snapshots here. So what I'm doing is I'm actually looking to see if I've ever plugged in an external drive to back up my computer, which I now just reminded myself I need to start a time machine backup on my main computer. That would probably be a good thing to do. If I had done that, what will happen is that when your time machine disk is not connected to the Mac, it'll start backing up locally. So it'll start backing up locally the system, and that goes into an area of the system which you can't navigate to through the GUI. Um, but it exists um, and it will contain deleted files. And what I mean by delete is like, the user deletes it, but it got captured by the, 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 the backup and it's there, there, but it's not on the current system, the current state of the machine. It's in the previous state of the machine 
and it's deleted, right? So we can recover those files and the names and the timestamps with other solutions. They're reverse engineering the image they make and they have to carve that data. So, you know, when they say they can carve APS and pull stuff out, they what they really mean, I believe, is going through and pulling out those uh, local time machine snapshots um, and pulling out the things there. With our solution and using native solutions, um, you can actually get the, the dates and times because the things you're only caring about are the files that are modified or deleted from the system. That's what we do. It's kind of more complicated than it seems, right? There's actually rocket science that goes into this. And what I mean by that is you're going to do a differential analysis on the different states and snapshots from the current state of the, of the machine versus the old states of machine and only do the, the files that have changed and modified, I'm sorry, changed or deleted. So those are what we pull out for you in snapshots. Um, of course, we support hash sets and stuff in here if you're wanting to worry about that. So we see Project Vic versions here. We just do standard SQLite. We like to go simple and CSVs so we can keep it, keep it simple, stupid kind of thing. Yes, we can carve files and data from files. So um, think like your open source tools for just like a scalpel or bulk extractor or you know, different things that can pull out information like uh, credit card numbers and URLs and email addresses and all those fun things too, right? So you can create your own databases, your own hash sets. You can mark things as seen and unseen, which is kind of cool because I know as I go through stuff, I'm just like, I don't want to see that anymore. I've already seen it and I just want to clear something out. You can send things to a bucket. So there's where your plist viewers, hex viewers, SQLite viewers or registry viewers come in. Um, you can go to the source, like where does this actually, it'll take you straight to where it belongs. You can add a note or remove notes. Oh, speaking of that, yeah, we got a new button, right? This one, my examiner space. This is kind of simple and cool, right? You just go ahead and I'm going to put use UTC in there, add a timestamp, right? And begin taking that blah, 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 blah. Go down the next one. I did something else, blah, 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 blah. So you can actually export this to a report as well. So you have your case notes there. Um, so to do it, that's kind of, or you can just do a simple to-do list so we can add a different task in here. We can check things off as we go along, like remember to beat the hell out of the suspect when we get done with the case, like that kind of thing, the things that are important. So our right, email file analysis, we can do that kind of stuff as well. And here you can see the different accounts. Um, we can go in here and we can pull out and see the attachments or we can see the data raw. So you can see the headers, you can see the message and stuff in here. Um, oh, these are your automated analysis artifacts, which is goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So like there's all your messages. Um, we get back to detailed information and how much time we got. Okay. All right, got 20 minutes. All right, so since we got all these different artifacts in here that we can put from like USB logs and different things, there's also, um, wow, so these are all your USB serial numbers and vendor IDs. Um, we do do some stuff which is kind of neat, like um, FOSS system events and quarantine events. So even if somebody has like basically erased their um, internet history, this is typically one of the artifacts that doesn't get erased with that. Knowledge C database stuff, right? That's one of the cool things. That can be annoying because it's a lot of information and it's, you know, you got to go through it and pick out what's relevant, but it's helpful, right? You know, it's kind of stuff like, you know, did the display wake up or something like that? Did something change with the, you know, the hardware? So there's a lot of things that we pull out of there. File system events, which I can't find. So I'm going to use this nifty feature up here and type FS events. That one I'm not going to click because it's, what is it? Six, almost 700,000 events. Great, great, great tool. This is like when people go, how do I know what happened on a system or how can I prove a file was there or deleted or modified? I had one case um, that I did, I don't know, not, not too much, not too long ago, but it was really simple. I cherry pick cases just to stay relevant and all. And it was a guy from um, local big city that basically was like they had a terminated employee, but they didn't walk the employee out right away. <laughs> they left her there at her desk for three hours. And what happened was she's like, I'm going to have fun and started deleting a whole bunch of, you know, intellectual property. And then when it came time for her severance pay, the company's like, now nah, you're not getting the severance pay. You destroyed all of her data. And she's like, well, you owe it to me. And then I didn't destroy any data. So they hired us to basically go, can you tell us what happened in the last three hours when we told her, I'm like, gosh, I found out through Foster's events. She just sat there and deleted, 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 deleted stuff. And you can see all 
all that cool things with file system. It's what, what's really great. Someone's got a quick question about oh. machine snapshots. So they're saying, uh, is, uh, did you say that I can find out where backup exists by looking at the snapshots feature? Oh yeah. So what we can do with, with depending on that's depending on how it's imaged, right? So um, we have another tool, right? Recon ITR, which uses native. We use all native technologies to do our imaging. We super highly kind of. Um, recommend that you stick to native formats that we do, not your AFF4s, which have been bastardized over the years, not your EO1s, of course. You know, we have the ability to do some of that stuff, but we don't recommend it. If you're going to stay within the Mac environment, you won't lose data. You'll get to see metadata and you can process time machine snapshots if they exist. So we had the ability to actually, you know, if you right click on a source, you'll see if it's available, snapshots will pop up here and then you can process them and then it'll show up in that category. So hopefully that'll actually help you out and answer your question. If not, just let me know. All right, so lost my train of thought. Oh, down here, we do these cool things down here, which is uh, redefined results. Just some simple things, right? Like messenger stuff, like who's this person talking to and when are they talking to? So you can see right there, and oh, this, is, this has got me in trouble many times. So this is kind of a breakdown of, of an account, a phone number, whatever it may be. You click on it, and there could be multiple ones in here, and it tells you who you're talking to a certain percentage of time. When I'm saying this has got me in trouble many times is when I'm testing it and I'm running my own data against it, my CEO has way more messages than my wife does, and she's like, hmm, uh-huh, yep, okay. So anyway, if you double click on it, you can actually see the message that are in there in the timeline. You can do it as a daily view and stuff like that as a graph view. We can go down to literally like, you know, down to days or hours if you want to see who they were talking to and when and just hover over it and tell you. You can export this. Again, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff in here. Uh, browser history, which is kind of cool, right? You can, this is nice. I'd like to order this by the timestamp because again, I, I switch back and forth between Brave Browser, Safari, Chrome, all those different types of one, but it puts them all together for you and gives you kind of a lot of stuff in here like who are they going the most right so just a quick view just go like oh, this guy's going to you know mlb.com mostly and then spending next to his time on google and facebook and then tesla you know that kind of stuff so we can see really quick where this guy spends his time and same thing we coordinate anything that's got it um anything that actually has a uh longitude latitude um geo coordinate with it we can put in here and then do the mapping features as well if you just bring it over this way and again we can switch through and you can see things change so there we go and again we can go online with this if we wanted to oh there's so much to talk about so little time all right so let me do this with the timeline let's go to timeline so again i talked about we have a super timeline which is the simplest thing to do now there's different timestamps that are out there which is um, what a lot of people don't understand, people just think of this simple Mac times when it actually comes to um, doing data, right? It, it, in the Mac, it's way more than that. So I told you the Unix timestamps or your Mac timestamps, no pun intended. Um, those actually are, are not utilized by the Mac themselves. They're favored instead of for the extended attribute timestamps. So I, I call them like finder timestamps because that's the ones that you see the most, right? But there's also, you know, artifact specific timestamps that are in there as well. So there's a lot of different things. So you have file system records or timestamps, and then you have artifact timestamps. So when you're building a super timeline, you want include both so i can you know all these artifacts that i showed you up here on the side we can actually build these different timestamps and if you're wondering why i have a difference between csv and sqlite it is because if you get over approximately a million records uses like 1.4 million on csv a lot of spreadsheet programs they kind of just they kind of stop working so sqlite's awesome you can get up to at least a terabyte of information in there so and they're easy to work with if you know how to do sql like queries and stuff and you can even bring them back into our tool and use our tool to do that as well so it's kind of neat but the other timeline thing which is really 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 cool is the artifacts timeline and then this is how this this is a game changer if i can make it work there we go so I unchecked file system events because I told you there's like 700,000 events in there, right? And I can set a timeline. So again, if you check this button right here, the file system events, just prepare to wait a little bit, you know, because if you have a lot of artifacts in there, same thing with like the knowledge C database. So I can pick, like if you look at all these different timestamps you hear, this is extended attribute timestamps, artifact timestamps, file system timestamps. It's everything that you can think of, but what it's going to do when you set your date range is it's going to incorporate this into a view, right? So that's obviously you can see 
um, for one year. I can break it down to month and day and then and of course to hour, right? So, but what's really cool about this is I can sit here and look at this in the uh, table view. And then this is what I love because now I can put everything in order. I can go in order, like literally down to the second or max, like now nanoseconds, right? I can get down to the seconds and actually see what a person's doing in sequence, right? And that's where stories change. So I, I had the privilege to, to help with another case without mentioning names, but basically it was a national, you know, news incident type thing. And, and it was one of our debates, you know, gun control, because, you know, we love our guns down here. So the thing is like, you know, this is what happens. And there was an incident occurred. Some people got shot, of course, unfortunately. And the question was, was it planned or was it like a, like a spur of the moment type thing? So, you know, the outcome, you know, would have a great impact on gun control for the, the gun lovers and the gun haters, right? So everybody wanted to know the outcome of this particular a uh, question the the agency that was doing it was using traditional tools and what they did was is they did the normal thing well wow he's purchasing a lot of stuff from there and ooh, wow look at how many websites he went to for guns and then wow yup this guy planned it right luckily for them they said can you take a look at it and you just see make sure we're, we're we're doing the right thing like have a second set of eyes look at it well through an episode of The Walking Dead, we just let our tools run and put it through here. And then we could actually see in sequence, you know, when this guy went to a website, when this guy scheduled calendar events, when this guy was talking to someone, when he was sending emails in logical sequence, like when you pick up a book and you start at the beginning and you read your way to the end, it makes more sense. When you read it that way, you look at the data that way in logical sequence, right? You can actually see that this guy did not plan it. It was a trigger event. It's a long, sad story, but it involves PSTD and stuff like that. But anyway, the thing was, um, you can see in, in order of events what occurred and that this guy didn't plan it. It was just something triggered him and then he went off and did what he did. So, um, you know, at least we were able to get to the truth and be unbiased about it. But again, just think of how many times if you're if you're not putting things in proper sequence or proper context in order, you're required to actually make um, you know, the courts are relying on you or the, you know, your your people are relying on you to give an accurate opinion based as an expert on what you found. But if you don't put it in the proper sequence, how can you even, how can you even do that? So, you know, I, of course it's gonna be case by case and stuff, but we can see right here exactly like what this guy's doing like in sequence, like this guy opened Brave Browser and he checked his mail. Then he went to Google and he searched here because these are like last visit dates. We can see a lot of things being triggered, you know, basically from the Knowledge C database. Then you see a bunch of stuff from his iCloud logs. So he's accessing these accounts right here. And then we can just go on down. You can see right here he's connected to, right? Or updated to um, an actual um, SSID through here in his router and we can keep on going down there. You can see in sequence exactly what happened. And there's even stuff in here like wake times, which I love, right? Because that comes from the logs and stuff too, where a person, you know, if you have a laptop, you can wake up the system by doing different things that requires a human to do it. And so anyway, we can tell, you know, when a person woke up the system, because a lot of times people claim, well, that wasn't me, right? Well, then who came into your house at this particular time of the day or night and opened a lid of your computer and then started accessing your internet? Who was it if it wasn't you? And why does it keep happening every night at 12, 15 after midnight? You know, that kind of stuff when everybody's sleeping in the house, like that kind of thing. So this is a really good thing and it can be exported and looked at. Um, very cool though. It's very, very cool option that we have here. Let me see if I can, oh, time zones. Let me show you that one really quick. So back here in the preferences and stuff here, again, just something really simple to do. We're going to add a time zone between this time and this time we were in this particular time zone. You know, between this time and this time, we were in another time zone. And we can apply that against the case so that you're not just stuck with GMT or you're not just stuck with one particular time zone. Because even where I live in the wonderful tropical world of Delaware, with hence the palm tree behind me, right? Um, it, we have daylight savings time down here. So hopefully that'll happen soon, but it'll switch over um, to daylight. So even if you're standing still in the same place, the time zones are gonna switch. You have two time 
time zones to contend with, you know, if the computer has been up for at least six months or so. So that has to happen. So we're all doing it wrong that way too, but at least we built into here now that you have the ability to do this as well. Um, some other things while we're in here, you can actually load external applications, send things out to different things there. This is where you would configure all your different, you know, keywords. Um, we could do uh, blacklisting, whitelisting, all that stuff that you would expect in a tool can be done here. Um, volatility, that's what we use for a RAM analysis. So if you have volatility, you can go ahead and point it to that and it'll do it for you. You have to do the downloading configuration of volatility, um, obviously for certain reasons. Um, wow, any questions? I covered a lot. Did I miss anything? Not anything major, no. Um, uh, storyboard reporting maybe? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that. geez, that's the big major one. Oh yeah, the storyboard thing. Thank you, John. <laughs> See, he's younger. All right, so where is this? <laughs> Uh, it's here right now. So up here where our report buttons are. All right, yeah, yeah, we were the first to include a WYSIWYG editor into into a forensic tool. Minor footnote. Yeah, just minor <laughs> footnote. Just, you know, I'm just cool like that. So, all right, so I just type in a report. So let me see if I can hide the genitalia. That's pretty cool. So I'm gonna create a report here. So WYSIWYG editor, right? So what you see is what you get. Um, this is kind of cool, right? So again, here, if you uh, want to change anything, you can, you know, if that's not important to you, you can delete it. If something else is important to you, like, you know, say you can't find the smoking bun, you can just add it and you can get them arrested and prosecuted. It just works really great. But up here was what you can have is all your different bookmarks, as you can see. Um, and it's kind of neat. You can just right click on this and add record to the case or add record with files really quick. It just drops into the report. And again, this can all be adjusted, you know, in your configuration, however you want. But all the information that you could want is there. And this obviously can be exported in different ways and stuff like that. We can save this out um, to different views and stuff that you can produce the report. Um, you can also import stuff into it so you can add reports from other stuff into here as well. So you can do your whole report in here if you want to. But the really cool thing in here is aside from this right here, let me get rid of that, is the part about um, let me just do the skin tone one first. Let me see if I can go to that one. All right, so this is what's been identified by skin tone. Let me take a couple of these things in here. This is a couple of pictures. And then see where it says blur image. We can still do the blur image. That's what we started with. And let me see if this works. We're going to censor skin tone tagged images. And so when I right click and add records with files to reports, and if everything works the way I hope, I love the spinning beach ball. Um, it should add those images to the report and cover up anything. Oh, it did cover up anything that that would be identifying to a person. So like their face, of course. So their face you can see here has been blacked out and then anything with genitalia and well, they got one side, not the other side. So they got anything they started covering up here that could potentially show something. So I guess it works pretty well. It's like so you can see even for like bikinis and things like that, it's got, Oh, that's why the face there and in the armpit. That's that's good. Yeah, that's really bad looking. All right. So yeah. So anyway, the AI, not me, actually goes and decides what is what you probably shouldn't see and stuff. So it works pretty good. I mean, it's more over cautious as you can see than it is like under stuff. So like you know, I've like I said, I I was joking around I'm like, wow, that person's feet are just too you know, it's too amazing. They had to cover it up. So, but then, okay, back past the skin tone and blocking stuff before I get myself in trouble. All right, so there's a bunch of other things in here, but one of the things that's really cool is this right here, this button is for timeline. So what happens, it does, it takes all your bookmarks and you can order them in there by, um, by sequentially. So what you did now is you just took everything that you thought was important in the case, right? And now you can put it in your report in a proper order. And I know this is a lot of stuff in here, so, I'm just going to take a bunch of uh, examples here um, because a lot of time stamps are in here and you can filter those out, but I'm just taking a bunch of stuff so I can add these now um, into the report in sequence. And so when you give the report to someone, it's like this happened first, this happened second, this happened third. So it makes it a lot easier to go ahead and um, make sense out of what you found. And then again, it's just it just makes sense to me to do it that way. Again, I, I know I'm a weird bird, so. Any questions? Anybody still there? <laughs> there? I, have a, I have a question, actually. Sure. 
So with regards to the picture blocking and picture blurring, does it note in the report that the software has automatically done that so that the reader of the report doesn't just assume that that was the original source photo? No, actually it doesn't, but that's a, that's a good point. So the, the, these AI features that you're seeing that are in here now that we're showing literally just came out this year. So and this year's new. So, but that is something I can definitely write down that we can annotate that that was, um, that was blocked out intentionally. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good point. Any, yeah. any other questions? I was going to say in the meantime, you can just add it to the report yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John's <laughs> good thing like, about a good editor. Yeah, this is like do it yourself. There you go, add it yourself. Blocked <laughs> out by, you know, AI. So, any other questions? Any comments? Any suggestions? Remarks. Yeah, rude remarks, insults, anything, <laughs> anything. Okay, well, if there's nothing, um, it's Dave Burton now jumping in. I'm with Teal Tech Canada. Um, fantastic presentation. I really liked the uh, the time zone feature. Um, just a bit about my background. I spent over 30 years in law enforcement uh, with Peel Regional Police just outside of Toronto and Toronto International Airport was within our jurisdiction. So we dealt with a lot of travelers and uh, a feature like that would be uh, very helpful because trying to put a timeline together without a feature like that can be quite cumbersome when you have a traveler coming in that's committed offenses through multiple jurisdictions and multiple time zones. Uh, very interesting feature and the reporting feature. I love that as well. Um, I find a lot of the tools, it's very cumbersome how you uh, ultimately get your report out. Um, that seems to be a very intuitive, uh, very powerful way to prepare your report. Um, just want to thank you, Steve. I have fantastic presentation. Obviously, this tool is very robust and needs a lot more uh, time and uh, explanation. Um, uh, I'm sure we can uh, we can uh, uh, you know have further sessions in the future if there's if there's interest. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, Teal is hosting some uh, Macintosh forensics training coming up. Uh, if you want to take your your Macintosh forensic examination skills to the next level, uh, we are running uh, a course, a 101 course and a 102 course. So the 101 course. Uh, is designed for both beginner and advanced Mac examiners. And sorry, the 201 course is uh, more for uh, advanced uh, Macintosh forensic examiners. And these courses, the 101 course, will be running October 30th to November 4th at our Toronto location, which is actually in Vaughan, if you've been to our classroom there. And the 201 course is uh, running December 5th to December 9th of this year, same location in Toronto. And both of these courses are recommended for Samari's uh, Certified Forensic Mac Examiner Certification Program that uh, you could then, once you take these courses, go on and become a Certified Forensic Mac Examiner. Um, I know from my experience uh, working with Peel, you know, 15 years, I was 19 years in their digital forensics unit. 15 years ago, we rarely seen a Mac. Um, when I left, I retired in 2020. Um, we were seeing them on a weekly, if not a daily basis. There was a, a, a Mac mini or uh, an iMac or some uh, device walking through the door um, and always a challenge to examine. So, um, would highly recommend if you're seeing the same trends that uh, that you would seek out this training and and maybe the certification. Yeah, and the one really key um, component to that, it's all vendor neutral. It's completely vendor neutral. Absolutely, absolutely. Good point. So if there's any other questions, uh, now's the time. You can unmute yourself and ask directly or throw it up in the chat and we will grab it. If not, we thank you for your time. Steve, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to say before we close this off. Only as, as I would say to everybody, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you guys. Absolutely, and thank you very much from Teal Tech, same thing. Um, stay safe and healthy and uh, we will let you know if there's anything like this in the future coming up.
Just, just one more thing before we um, split. Someone's asking if there's going to be a recorded version for later viewing. Ange, maybe you can jump in on that. Hi there. Yeah, we'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel probably in the next two few days or so. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, thank you, Steve. Thank you, John. And uh, hope to talk to you again soon in the future and maybe see some of the participants out at the 101 and 201 training. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a thank good one. you. Bye-bye. Bye now.